Hey there, how you doing? I'm Matt Cowan and you're listening to the Bureau Asia podcast. The podcast that aims to bring you a little bit of everything from history and food to brews and news and everything in between, hopefully with a few laughs, and which may just be the best way to keep up with what's happening in Vietnam without even being in Vietnam. Or if you're here already, without even leaving your home unless you have to, say, uh, to collect your grab food delivery downstairs. Hey, I hope you're well wherever you're listening in from. Let me know where you are. Of course, I'm here in Ho Chi Minh City, as always. The city, by the way, that's just pipped Beijing, Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur in Time Out's recently published World's 20 Best Cities for Food Right Now list on the London-based magazine's website, timeout.com. How about that, hey? To be honest, I have no idea if Time Out knows what it's talking about, but hey, when you make a list, as long as it's a good one, then it's worth talking about, isn't it? The list ranks the 20 best cities in the world for food right now in 2024. And each city has a small blurb of about 150 words or so written about it, justifying why it was chosen for the list, which I'd like to share a little bit with you today. I won't go into too much detail though, because you can digest that full list for yourself after this episode. I'll leave a link in the show notes so you can do that. But yeah, I'm always curious to read or hear what people have to say about Ho Chi Minh City. I mean, I'm sure you're interested in what others say or write about wherever you live, right? But before I spoon feed you some highlights, let's take a quick look at how this list was put together and what criteria, if any, there were in order to do it. According to the author of the piece, Grace Beard, who's Time Out's travel editor based in London, What makes a great food city isn't its number of plaudits and Michelin stars, she says. Which reminds me, hold that thought, the Michelin Awards for Vietnam will be held at the end of this month here in Ho Chi Minh City. You know, I still find it hard to believe that I'm saying that. Michelin Awards Vietnam. It doesn't seem that long ago that you couldn't even get a decent hamburger in this city. How things have changed. Anyway, where where was I? Um... Oh yeah, so a great food city isn't about plaudits and Michelin stars, according to Time Out, but rather it's about options and good quality meals at reasonable prices. Uh, Whoa, hang on a minute, back up. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Good quality meals at reasonable prices. Who would have thunk? Let me just pull up my Michelin star guide. I have one here somewhere. Um, well, not not really. I have a screenshot of the definitions of one, two, and three stars because I knew this was going to come up. Anyway, here we go. One star, a very good restaurant in its category. Two stars, excellent cooking worth a detour. Now... Keep in mind, the Michelin Guide came about initially for the benefit of motorists, hence the use of words like detour. And finally, three stars, exceptional cuisine worth a special journey. Now, at the risk of getting sidetracked here for a moment, I think it's worth noting that it seems a lot of the confusion around why a restaurant receives a star over another restaurant in its category or comments around the worthiness of a star, you know, whether this restaurant deserves a star and this one doesn't, appear to centre around people not really knowing the definition of one star, which is simply a very good restaurant in its category. Nothing more, nothing less. How that's judged though, well, I'll leave that up to the experts, but at the end of the day, one star means a very good restaurant in its category. Let me know the furthest you've detoured just to eat somewhere. I've been known to drive to Vung Tau just to eat. Now, Vung Tau is a small coastal city around 100 kilometres, I think, southeast of Saigon. And depending on the route and mode of transport, generally takes a couple of hours to get there for most people. Uh, It usually takes me about four, though, on the motorbike, give or take, with a few stops and getting lost here and there. But yeah. I'm very fond of Vung Tau and it has some of the best food in Vietnam. So check it out sometime if you get the chance. Anyway, back to the story. It appears um, Time Out magazine goes by quite a similar criterion as Michelin. That is 
good quality meals at reasonable prices. However, where Time Out's list appears to slightly differ in gathering its data is that they say they quiz the locals on their city's must-visit restaurants, must-eat dishes, best-value bites, and they ask them to rate their city's food scene on both quality and affordability. I have no info on how many people were questioned or what method was used, whereas I believe Michelin has international inspectors visit based on tip-offs from local foodies in the know and who may also have voting rights. I have absolutely no idea on that. It's all sort of shrouded in mystery. Anyway, once the timeout list begins to take shape and rankings added, The editors asked their global network of timeout editors and writers to give them the lowdown on what makes their city an exciting dining destination. Okay, so based on that criteria, I think it seems fairly solid. I mean, these lists are always fraught with inconsistencies and mystery, aren't they? And, um, you know, I don't think anyone has ever come up with a foolproof way of ranking things like this anyway. But Based on timeout's explanation here, I think it seems pretty fair, I reckon. Anyway, after all, Ho Chi Minh City is epic for food. They've got that right at least. So let me know what you think at the Bureau Asia. So what did timeout say about Ho Chi Minh City? Well, not all that much, to be honest. Uh, Nothing we don't already know, I guess, except that Ho Chi Minh City has emerged as Vietnam's most exciting dining destination. Now, for listeners in Hanoi, ouch, Uh, sorry for you guys, but I have to agree on that one. And basically, Time Out says that within walking distance, you can eat lunch at Saigon's most famous banh mi vendor. I'm not going to say the name. If you know, you know. And besides, we all have our own favourites, which reminds me, stick around till the end of the episode when I introduce you to an epic banh mi place you shouldn't miss while you're here. Now, um... Where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay. In Saigon, you can have lunch at its most famous bun mi vendor. Then just a short walk away, have dinner at a Michelin star restaurant. And you know what? I totally agree. Saigon is actually a very convenient city for dining out and hitting the town on a night out. Much of it is either a short walk to get to or just a short and inexpensive cab ride away. Now, the only thing I disagree with Time Out on is that they nominate pho as the must-eat dish when in Saigon, whereas I'd say Bum Bo Hui is actually the must-eat dish in Saigon ahead of pho in the noodle soup category, at least anyway. But hey, that's just my opinion. It's a very good dish in its category at a reasonable price worth stopping here for. (laughs) How about that? So what do you think? And also, what do you think about Ho Chi Minh City coming in ahead of every other city in Asia? Surely you have an opinion on that. Let me know by getting in touch on Instagram and Facebook at The Bureau Asia. Alternatively, you can do so by commenting on Spotify, if that's your platform of choice, or on YouTube. I now have a dedicated tab for podcasts there, at The Bureau Asia. Just look for the podcast tab on the homepage. Oh, and by the way, in case you were wondering which cities took out the top three positions on Time Out's list, they were Lima, Peru, at number three, Johannesburg, South Africa, at number two, and Naples, Italy at number one. Okay, tip tail next. Well, the school holidays are upon us here in Vietnam and so is the movie season. So that means there are a bunch of movies about to be released this month. And among those is the horror thriller Mong Vut, or in English, Claws. Mong Vut, from what I can gather from the trailer, is set up in the hills of Da Lat in Vietnam's beautiful central highlands, where a group of friends have driven up to from Saigon for the weekend to camp, hang out, and get up to whatever young people get up to these days. But little do they know, there's some kind of dangerous beast that, spoiler alert, looks a lot like a zombie grizzly bear to me and is running loose in the forest where the young group of friends is camped looking for dinner. So suddenly, what was going to be a chilled weekend away from the city, getting back to nature and all things tranquil, 
turns into an epic fight for survival. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun to me and I'm looking forward to seeing it when it opens this weekend. I'm also looking forward to chatting to the director of the film, Lee Tan Sun, who just happens to be a mate of mine. His is a name you may have heard before if you're familiar with Vietnamese films. He's perhaps best known for the 2017 rom-com Em Chua Moi Dum. The English translation is, I'm not 18 yet, although the English title of the film is Jailbait, a movie about a playboy's life running off the rails after he finds out he's just slept with a girl who hasn't quite yet turned 18. Hmm, and uh, I'm going to admit it here right now that I thought it was a crack up and I loved it. So, as you can imagine, Claws is quite the departure from M. Jua Moi Tham for Le Tan Sun, which is pretty cool. And what's even cooler is I've got Sun on the line right now to have a quick chat with me about his latest film. Hello. Hey, buddy, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. All right, cool. Are you in the car, are you? Yes. Oh, okay. All right, cool. All right, let's get into it so I don't waste your time. Hey, um, thanks heaps for taking time out to chat to me today. It's a busy week for you, I know, so thanks for that. Uh, You're welcome. And uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, share my thoughts uh, to your uh, podcast. Thanks heaps. So this time round, your latest movie release is a horror thriller, so it's a bit different from... M. Jua Moi Tham back in 2017. What made you decide to do a horror film this time? Actually, this movie is kind, you can, you can call it uh, bloody M. Jua Moi Tham because <laughs> the uh, character system is based on M. Jua Moi Tham words oh. where, you know, uh, the people, where the students in the same uh, international school and this is the student in the, the national school too, in that circle. So they have uh, blonde hair and they mix. That's my character. I love. So after I finished, uh, after I done uh, MD with time, and I thought, what if this group of youth go into the woods and make a heaven party and we meet a monster? <laughs> uh, we meet a, a bit and what happened because we after empty with them I love the, the the relationship between them between them that's what I build up and I need something to challenge their love so I think have a group like empty with them going to the wood and and meet a beat and we see how they uh, take care of each other how they protect each other and how they become heroes so and another fact, and another fact, if you if you see that uh, I star with an action movie called Class Beta, right. and then Empty with Time is a rom com, and now it's a you can call this this the genre is a teen horror. The teen horror is the typology that I you know loved when I was fourteen and fifteen, where you know, Vietnam at that time doesn't have uh, internet, and that's how I learned English. Uh, by movie. Oh, so, right. Interesting. So, yeah. So, I grew up with the uh, 80s uh, band, like Bonds of B, and I grown up with, you know, uh, I know what you did last summer. Right. Uh, yep. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's it like my subconscious to to mix, you know, something between Empty Mui Dam and my memorize about a pathology that I love before. Okay, really interesting. So um, what was some of, you know, the, the film is set presumably up in the Central Highlands around near Dalat, is that right? Oh, yeah. Uh, you, can, you can say so, but I don't want to mention where it is right. because, because the word that I view in Mongol, is, I, uh, it's like, you know, the fairy tale right. of okay. adults. So I, I try to be a word, like a fantasy word, that where you can, you know, jump into that. And it's on the highland. Uh, be- Why I put it on the highland? Because I need, I need, a, I need a cliff. Yeah. Right. I need a cliff for guys to fall out. So, and I, I need a, a higher place to tell the story, to raise the feeling of the audience, to raise the vision, to raise, you know, the violence of the, yep. the, of the tale. 
yep. become fairy tale. Yes. Um, so, what sort of challenges did you have with filming in such a challenging environment? Oh, it's a lot. We, um, I remember that we uh, we shoot on June and July. That is the rain season, and uh, we uh, instead of we build everything in the studio, but you know, I I push the the crew going to the nature because I want them to have a true feeling. So we have to deal with mud, with raining, with <laughs> with everything, environment attack us. And uh, we bring a lot of lighting into the wood and mm. light, you know, the whole wood. <laughs> and um, yeah, it drags us like, you know, from, from, from night to morning, every night to morning. Man, now... That this question is too big for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just want, I just wanted to get a sense of how difficult it was because in my mind it, it sounds really difficult. Now, um, I this... can tell you for three days how you know for <laughs> how many things that uh, we we dealing with. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so this weekend, when the film opens to the general public, what do you hope audiences will get out of seeing your film? I hope they enjoy the love in the movie <laughs> because, uh, yeah, because this is a survival movie. This is a horror movie, but it just challenges one thing that challenges the love and they have to feel love. They, if they want to feel love, please come to the theater yep. and, and they understand. Yeah. And friendship, love and the love of the friendship, the love, you know, each other and the love of life, love the nature. Okay, Even All right. it, it sounds the like last breath. <laughs> it sounds like you're giving me a bit of a hint of what the movie's about. Now, uh, before I let you go, um, you know mm-hmm. I've been asking you for many years to write a part for me in one of your films. You know, I've been asking to play the evil white guy in one of your films. Do you think that's going to happen anytime in the future? Can you oh, do yeah. that for me? Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, man. I, I, I would love to because uh, the international uh, look and vision and and mind and thinking is always happen in my movie. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I, I guess uh, you know it's sort of a "don't call me, we'll call you" kind of situation <laughs> by the sounds of it. So anyway, once you're done with the premiere this weekend, once you're finished with it, what are your plans? Are you going to go up camping in the hills of Dalat or something? <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh. No, 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 no. I am. I'm really busy to making another movie, oh, right. and okay. uh, I have job to do with Honda, and um, and later on maybe a month or a month and a half, and then we have a retreat to the mountain to write another script to oh, amazing uh, to make another movie, man. Oh, that sounds great. Sounds and, like you're really busy. And, yeah, it's gonna be a high concept movie, and it's uh, it's gonna be a Tom Lips movie. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right, mate. Yeah. Um, I better let you go. I hope I. Uh, yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you for for your invitation, and uh, yeah. hope that uh, what I'm sharing is uh, make you uh, interesting. No, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I'm going to go and check it out this weekend. Um, all the best for Friday night, and I'll catch oh, yeah. up catch up with you soon. Hopefully. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank right. you very much. Cheers. And uh, if uh, if better if you go to the Snake Show. Well, today and tomorrow is better for oh. the movie because we need yeah, to, to bubble the light for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It depends on the, the sneak show. So if you have friends and you're interested, please come to the theater today and tomorrow. Uh, which theater? Uh, any theater. Any theater. They have uh, okay. one or two gigs of the, the show. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thanks heaps for that. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, man. That was director Lee Tan Sen. You can catch Mong Vut at cinemas around the country from this Friday, June the 7th. Check all your local guides for details. And if you're an English speaker, there are English subtitles, so you won't miss out on all the action. Given that the first segment in this episode was about food, I wasn't going to include this, but then I thought, why not? Because in the last week, 
I've eaten at a couple of places that are worthy of a shout out, including a coffee shop in District 3 that I really enjoyed. So uh, what will I kick off with then? Vietnamese food or Western food? Okay, I guess let's go with Vietnamese, hey? So first up, I want to shout out Ban Mi Gam Hung in District 4. Like so many of the businesses here in Vietnam, it's a family-run operation and is now third generation, with the original owner's granddaughter now beginning to take over the tongs, so to speak. The business was established 40 years ago in this very location. And what makes this place special is the sheer amount of meaty delights they serve up each day from 3pm off the grill on the side of the street. So what you get here is bun mi, that's their specialty, but I think it's fair to say it's nothing like the ones you might be used to seeing on social media. If you're thinking bun mi huyen hua, then it's nothing like that. Here at Gam Hung, they specialise in huge, and when I say huge, I mean huge pork chops done on the barbie, which they duly carve up to stuff into your mouth-watering bun mi. And they also do bo la lot bun mi. Bo is the Vietnamese word for beef, and la lot is a kind of green leaf and has been described as a betel leaf. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very pungent leaf, almost medicinal in flavour, you might describe it as, but it's not really like betel nut leaf, which is typically chewed in Southeast Asia as a stimulant. It's kind of chewed how tobacco is or once was chewed. I've actually chewed betel in Myanmar and India, and it's something you don't eat. You chew it for the rush and spit out the orangey, I think it was orange, orangey coloured spit. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that pretty. And um, around the streets, you see it spat out everywhere. Anyway, this kind of betel in Vietnamese cuisine is very different, but nevertheless, strong in flavour as well. And it has a very distinctive smell when it's being barbecued. Typically, small pieces of beef mince are wrapped up in it then placed on the barbecue. And you can smell it a mile off, even on the motorbike when you whiz by places that are cooking it. Mel, my wife though, she isn't a fan of it at all. (laughs) She was traumatised by it many years ago when she ate some dodgy stuff that made her sick and she hasn't touched it since. Although I kind of, well, encouraged, would that be the word, or forced? Forced her to try some here at Gam Hung the other day when we went um, and she still spat it out. Now, don't tell Auntie Gam Hung. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, also here they do bun mi siu mai. Siu mai is typically pork mince balls in a tomato sauce, um, you know, keeping it to keep it simple. Um, it's almost like an Italian meatball and then a few of them are dropped into a fresh baguette. It's very popular and, yeah, it kind of tastes like when you mop up after a big plate of meatballs and spaghetti with a crusty piece of bread, if that helps you picture it. This place is really worth checking out, but it might be a bit tricky to find if you're a tourist. However, if you're willing to go off the beaten path a bit and willing to sit on the back of a motorbike, then you'll find this place easy enough. Just look for all the blue smoke billowing out across the street and you'll know you've found it. In any case, I've left the address in the show notes so you can find it. Now, coffee lovers, I have one for you. This is more about the cafe itself than it is the coffee. And it's located in a fairly quiet part of District 3, only a few blocks from the War Remnants Museum, if you're familiar with that. So this might be a good place to go after a visit to the museum to wind down, you know, cool down and digest what you've just experienced at the museum. It's called Epic Coffee Roaster. It's spacious at over two floors, but it's not huge and soulless like some other places, you know, that you might have come across elsewhere. In fact, it's actually quite cosy. The furniture's comfortable. And I was able to sit there for a couple of hours the other day without my legs falling asleep, which is an achievement, um, or leaving with a back strain. So definitely a big tick of approval there. The service is unobtrusive. The staff here just do their job. They're friendly enough. Um, They're not overbearing and they don't dither. And the music, it's, um, I'm not, not sure how you'd describe it. It's kind of indie retro. Is it kind of an indie retro sound, whatever that means? Um, it's kind of wistful, I remember. Um, definitely not poppy and irritating. And it's played at the right volume, not loud, but loud enough so you don't get distracted by other customers' conversations, which can be a rare thing these days in Ho Chi Minh City. 
And the music, it's played at a level that you can actually hear yourself thinking, if that makes sense. The price for a coffee was reasonable from memory. Um, The coffee itself wasn't wow, but I'll definitely be back to try their other offerings when I'm in the neighbourhood. It definitely has a great vibe. And if you're into atmospheric, if that's a word to describe a cafe, if you're into these types of cafes where the owner seems to have put a lot of work into the design, then you'll love this one. And finally, an old favourite, the Elbow Room on Pasteur Street, which has been open since 2009. It's an American-style bistro that serves Western comfort food. Now, I know a lot of travellers listening to this, uh, you probably won't be interested in eating any sort of Western comfort food, but trust me, um, when you live here for for a little while, you do crave your old sort of comfort food from home. Uh, Mel and I have been coming here for years and I'm happy to say it's as good as ever. I had my doubts after the pandemic though, but there was no need to doubt it at all, it turns out. Make sure you try the blueberry pancakes. They're huge and probably the best value for money in Saigon at the moment. Now, Mel loves her pancakes and she's as good a judge as any, so you can trust her on that. She loves them. Uh, While I had the Eggs Benedict with ham, it comes with fries. I I don't really eat fries in the morning. I don't don't do it. Um, But I'll eat hash browns. And so I swapped the fries out for the hash browns for the same price. And again, Elbow Room is probably still the one to beat when it comes to Eggs Benny in this town. I don't know. They just seem right somehow. Now, the bill for that came in at about two... Well, the bill for the Eggs Benedict came in at about 240,000 Vietnam dong, which seems pretty standard, I think. Um, It's simple, tasty, fresh. You can't do much better than that. And this place is open early on weekends. I think on Facebook, it lists that it's open at 9am, but I feel like it's always, it's open earlier than that. Anyway, Now, the only small criticism I'd have is that service was slow, even when there are only six customers in the joint. But hey, we soon forgot about that when our brekkies came out. All up, our bill came to around 600,000 Vietnam dong for two adults, including coffee and juice. There was heaps of food, to be honest. We probably over-ordered. And yeah, that's for a Western-style breakfast. I think it's worth it for that. So check it out. I'll leave the address in the show notes. Okay, that's it for this episode. Thanks for joining me. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode and the podcast in general. And don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and now on YouTube. You can just comment, like, and share like you usually would on a video. It really helps a lot and costs nothing but a little of your time. I'm going to head out now and hit the streets to see if I can find you another little gem for you to check out when you're here next, or if you're here already when you have the free time. So until the next episode, take care and stay safe. And if you live in Ho Chi Minh City, stay dry if you can. This has been Matt Cowan. Ciao for now.